Tot nu jou. Good morning. I think some of you missed the On My Bus song by Plone. I suggest you Google it. The, the band that is also at CMS called Plone. Okay. So I, uh, this morning I, I want to talk to you about how TriMet improved their search. They were having challenges with search and um, I was called in to help with that. So who is TriMet? TriMet, TriMet is uh, basically, TriMet runs the, the entire public transportation system for the metropolitan area of uh, Portland, Oregon. And uh, <clears throat> just a few numbers. They have a budget of uh, 507 million. They cover a pretty large area, lots of people, and they are a freestanding government agency that is not a part of the city or any state or any, or, or the state. They run a lot of vehicles, buses, with uh, lots of buses, lots of stops, lots of uh, bus lines. The max, which is uh, the light rail, is sort of like a long distance uh, streetcar, with again, lots of vehicles, five rail lines, lots of miles of service and stations. The uh, Westside Express service is, is actually a, a full-size train commute for commuters, which uh, has a four, almost 50-mile um, service line with five stations and six vehicles. And then they run uh, paratransit. The uh, lift, which is paratransit service, and they run the streetcar, which is owned by the city of Portland, but it's actually maintained and operated by TriMet. And some of you probably, I know some of you went to uh, PyCon in Portland this this year and last year, and you will have experienced how awesome the. the public transportation system of Portland is, is really one of the best in the U.S., in my opinion. In terms of trips, they, uh, people take 101 million trips every year. In terms of coverage or size of the transportation system, is the ninth per capita in the country, even though Portland is a relatively small city uh, it's the 24th largest city in the U.S., um, but in terms of transportation system, it's a, it's a ninth, which, which would put it on par with Atlanta, which is a very large city. And I doubt that Atlanta has such a good system. Talking about employees, we get to the point where we start thinking about users for our systems. So, so, TriMet has 2,900 employees. 90% um, of these work in the field. So they are bus drivers, train conductors, operators, supervisors, maintenance uh, workers, construction workers. So, and, and so therefore they do need access to their internet, but they don't access it very frequently, they don't have, unlike the 10% that is administrative and they sit in an office and work in an office and presumably have, have access to a computer all day long, um, the rest of them don't. So the nine, act, and actually, so the majority of the employees have the can read role in Plone and it's there authenticated with the web server off. There are just about a dozen or maybe two dozen 
roughly speaking, of uh, content developers, which have the editor role. So that's, that gives you an idea of the user base for TriMet. So if it's not in the browser, we don't really know what to do with it. So, so let's talk about their, their IT infrastructure. So the public uh, facing site, trimet.org, is not actually clone. So if you go there, that's not clone. Uh, also not clone. You, you can imagine an, an organization of this size and the complexity has a lot of IT systems, um, internal web apps and internal sites, and um, obviously they are not clone. But they do have a clone. They do run clone sites, and before this project, they had over five clone sites. And I say over because some five sites were actually actively being used, and there were some others that were basically abandoned. So we got rid of them. Uh, of those five, three were blogs. One was a knowledge base, uh, sort of a document management system, and it was. The, it is still the, um, the repository for all of their technical documentation manuals for all of the technical uh, hardware that they, that they have. So for, for a trained nerd, this is paradise. You can find information about anything concerning trains, buses, communication systems, switches, anything you want. It's just awesome. Um, I talked about the other side, and then they have the intranet, uh, which is what the majority of this talk is about. And, uh, okay, after this project, so there were two sites left, because the three blogs were merged into the intranet, uh, yeah, the intranet. The knowledge base was upgraded from clone 3 something to clone 5, the latest one at the time. And the, the reason why they were stuck on 3 was because they had some clone 4 artists add-ons installed. And uh, so they, they could not upgrade, as you all probably are familiar with. And uh, I would like to thank Nathan and me for uh, wildcard fixed persistent utilities. Saved the day many times. And the trinet, the intranet, was already on clone 4.2 something or other, and so we upgraded to the latest. By the time we were done, there were actually four blocks, so they all got merged using lineage. So so while this project was in process, um, the four blogs maintained, kept looking exactly the way they were before, just by having a subskin for their for the subsite in Lineage, um, which is awesome. And then I'm going to talk a lot more about Trinet, so please stay. All right. Now you know who TriMet is. The project was basically the main goal was to improve searchability of their intranet, apart from up upgrading the knowledge base. And there were two pieces, there are three pieces to this. One was obviously if it's not if it's not responsive, people are not going to be able to, to use it on their on their phones. So it's got to be responsive. And uh, but there was a, it, this was not really a theming a retheming project, um, so we um, decided to just stick to basic boost, bootstrap with just a few color changes. Just and they have so they have an internal design team, and uh, so their directive was to do not get fancy, just make it. Don't make it look any different than Bootstrap so that I don't have to do a lot of work with Diazo. Um, just give us a couple of templates um, that look like Bootstrap and 
will we'll get fancy later. Another thing uh, was the use of covers, collective cover, because the idea was um, news publications, or, uh, magazines and newspapers and so on, know that they have developed an art to basically guiding you, the user, to what they want you to find. And, and the collective cover is a perfect, um, a perfect application for this. And so the idea was, well, let's, let's see if we can surface the information that we want users to find in a dynamic way so that people don't have to create a bunch of links on pages uh, manually and, and so on. And um, so I created, I developed a few custom tiles. At the time, Collective Cover did not have a calendar tile, now it does, I found out, but so I developed a calendar tile, and that is an example. So you as a, as a content developer, you just create events wherever they need to be on the site, and the page with the calendar tile just surfaces them, and you don't have to do anything about it. Um, just in one word here about this process of using covers and bootstrap. Lineage was great for this because uh, the, I created some uh, new landing pages using collective cover that were obviously themed with Bootstrap and tested and worked with you know the whole uh, compose composition process works with Bootstrap. So. But they needed to be built by the content developers. They, need, they needed to do a bunch of work to you know, populate the tiles just the way they wanted to. And then these tiles had to contain a bunch of links to production content. So instead of doing this whole work on a, as usual on a staging server, on our dev server, this all actually happened on the production server by using subsites with Lineage that were, so the rest of the site was completely unchanged, still the old theme, nothing changed, but the subsite had, had the new theme, Bootstrap, cover installed, running in there, and so they could create these covers, and then on the product, on the launch day, I could just turn on the theme for the rest of the site, copy and paste the pages, the, the, co the cover objects, over to where they needed to be, and switch them to be the default uh, landing pages for those for those folders. Um, so really, really, that's one reason why Lineage definitely got one one of my stars in the in the contest that we have out there. All right. So let's now dig a little deeper into Trinet the TriMet's intranet. So, the challenge. The challenge is, oh my god, our search results are useless. What are we going to do? And, IT gave us a mandate, no Elasticsearch. They did not want to have this additional um, dependency and stack installed on, on these virtual boxes that they <coughs> provided. So, what are, what are we going to do? Again, let's look a little bit closer at the internet. It was running 4.2.x. It didn't actually have a lot of add-ons because of the Clone for Artists. They were completely allergic to adding any add-ons. They just wanted plain clone as, as, as much as possible. So they, these were basically the main add-ons that they had. And if you can't read them, they are scrawl uh, for the blogs, content well portlets, web server off, CX Oracle, which is only used in one place and really like, could do without it, but uh, and Plumfontein. It's basically sunburst, almost unchanged. It's just a little bit customized in Portal Skins custom. And in terms of content, it had or 
has about 10,000 items. 70% uh, of those were files and images. And the rest were basically, the, most of them were pages, blog posts, and folders. So this is not really a huge site, but it's, it's, it's uh, where I think Plone's default search starts falling down. Probably even, even before, 10, before you reach 10,000, but by that point it becomes useless, especially with this many files. So they uh, used a bunch of workarounds. One was to exclude files and images, which you can do very easily in the search settings control panel. Just uncheck the box for file and image, and those they will no longer appear. And the result of this was, for example, if I search for non-revenue vehicle, um, I, before I got 226 results, most of which were files, and most of which the files. Okay, so the the snippets, the, the description under there does not tell you anything about the con where sort of Plone search found the keywords. In other words, you could have these words anywhere in the PDF, and you wouldn't know by looking at this web. Why, why am I getting this result? So they were really frustrated by that, and therefore they turned off files and images. And now you have, for the same search, we have 28 results. Um, and this is what it looks like now for the same for the same search. So this is just a little preview of more to come later. Another workaround is keyword stuffing. So somebody at some point figured out, hmm, what is this keyword thing? Uh, I wonder if uh, I can if I can trick the search by putting you know all the keywords that I think people want to find want to uh, use when they search for this particular page. I put them all in here and I can get my results up. Like there's this whole SEO craze. Um, and, and so at the, there were about 80 keywords, most of which were duplicates, where they were like singular and plural forms of the same word and um, hyphenated and non hyphenated word, uh, versions of uh, composite words or capitalized and lowercase, which obviously doesn't make any difference. Uh, or stuff like that. So that was useless. And then Link Force. I don't know if you remember 95, 1995, uh, Lycos or Excite or Alta Vista or even Yahoo, the way they looked. They were basically just, just, because they're, they're actual, the, the, you know, the keyword search that you typed didn't really wasn't really that, that helpful back before Google came along. So what they did, they had basically all these categories with links, and you clicked one link in there, and it took you to another place with lots of other subcategories and lots of other links, and that's how it worked. And that's basically, they figured out how to replicate this, this insanity. And, you know, when you are a user and you're looking for something in particular, having a whole page full of links isn't really going to help you. So, let's talk about, a little bit more about search. <coughs> um, let me get there. Okay. I don't know if, I don't know if you've ever uh, taken like a a bird's eye view of a Google search results page and realized how, how little effort it takes for your eyes to scan it and to immediately discard the things that you're not interested in and to zero in on exactly the right thing that is, is a good match for you. Um, and that, and they do, and it's done without a whole lot of fancy design stuff. It's, look at this. This is 
This is an individual search result. And look at the colors, look at the font sizes, and the uh, spacing, and the font weights. And I think we can do worse than just copy what Google has figured out. So, and also, okay, so, so the search page at a micro level, at the individual search result level, has some metadata that we want people to see. So definitely we want a title. We want a good descriptive title. Google puts URLs, I don't know if you noticed, Google puts URLs. If you think that at the, in this day and age, a lot of people don't really know what to do with URLs, but actually it's vital. It's really, really important to know what you're clicking on. Like it, just looking at the domain, it kinda, you can kind of get a good idea of what, where you're going. So that is really important. The byline, um, Google doesn't show it, but in an intranet, I think it's very important. You know, having a date, last modified, and the author. Uh, the snippet, aka description, aka summary, which, you know, the thing that, that we can do in Plone is different from what Google can do, but anyway. I think, you know, when we decided that tags are useful to have, in uh, search results, and we'll talk more about those later. And then icons or thumbnails could also be very good hints that I implemented something for that, but then it ended up not being used for now, maybe later. So, okay, let's skip through these. All right. This is a typical, well, not typical, but it's one of the worst examples I could find of a file. Um, this, this thing only makes sense to the person who created it. I mean, obviously, what, how could this ever, and I blurred out the name to protect the innocent. So, title, the title is really important, and just using the file name for a title is not, is less than useful. The other thing, a lot of people, a lot of times, um, even though the description is the description field is not mandatory to to save your content and clone, but a lot of people think they have to put something in it. So just copy and paste the title. I mean that again is another example of. I mean, give me some information about this thing, this type five odometer location. Don't just repeat the title. So, but uh, to be honest, this is not the user's fault or the, the content uh, editor's fault. It's a little bit, a lot of Plone's fault that Plone doesn't give editors any feedback on what, on the content uh, quality that they're creating. So, you know, these, these examples that I just showed you, uh, there's nothing to prevent people or to give people any hint that uh, they should, uh, that there's anything to improve there. And even if they wanted to improve something, wait, like, okay, so say uh, me as a content editor, I know I have created a bunch of files and I did not give them any titles and the file names are atrocious, but I created hundreds of them, and they're all over the place. How do I find them? I mean, do I really have to go through folder contents and search for them that way? It's, or even worse, description or other metadata that we would want to, to fix. Um, so that's, that's where we are falling down. We're not giving editors any help at all. And um, well, just uh, as an example, this is this is a screenshot of a uh, search result as it looks now. So you see, there's a tag, there's a byline, there's a, a URL without the HTTP in front because that's useless. Um, and a good title and a good description. So 
that's a good, that's, if all the search results were like that, we would still start working. Wait, there's more. Okay, at a macro level, no, don't do that. Google had one job, give me a picture of a guy without a tattoo. Actually, at a macro level, search is about two jobs. <coughs> Sorting and filtering. Because Google has, let's just throw a number, one trillion possible search results, okay? It doesn't just sort them, you know, it doesn't just give you a trillion sort, uh, search results sorted by the thing that you, the, the keyword that you typed. No, it also filters. But, okay. In Plone, the scoring algorithm that we use is something called OCAPI, BM25, BM stands for best match. And, um, not to, not to scare you with this formula, but um, there is actually, even though, even if you don't have any idea what this means and what this does, there is a lot you can learn just by looking at the formula and by looking at um, what it depends on and what it does not depend on. So, what it depends on is the frequency of each keyword in the particular document that is com computing a score for. So how often does this keyword appear? Um, the length of this particular document, the average length of all documents, the ratio of those two, and then the total number of documents in the whole set and the number of documents containing this particular keyword. That's, that's it. That's all this depends on, okay? If you think about that for a minute, you realize that this scoring algorithm does not understand anything about the context of a keyword in terms of either the location in the, in the, in the site or the location of a keyword inside a document. Uh, it does not. It doesn't include any document that does not contain any of the keywords. So, um, so, so if you're using a synonym, for example, it, that's your 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 uh, your own fault. If you misspell something, that's you can can help you there. And obviously, it doesn't offer any suggestions. So, so this is. This is why Plone's default search is, you know, it's fine when you install a Plone site and you start creating content, you know, 10 pages, a, dozen, a few dozen pages, a couple a hundred pages. Oh, search actually works pretty great. Now you get to a thousand or 10,000 and forget it. Um, so, thinking about that, I thought, Okay, I'll make my own custom sort order. And I'll make an index that depends on these four um, meta, well, th these four elements in this order. So for uh, content quality, two items that have the same score and content quality, it will then score higher one item that has tags versus one that doesn't. And then, um, uh, for, for the same score, it will, rank, it will rank content that is not a file higher, and then fi files. And then also, last modified, is, seems to be a pretty, pretty useful thing to sort on. And I'll, we'll, we'll get into content quality. 
Um, so, oh, so, so that's about the sorting, and now let's talk about filtering, because that's the that's the second big job that the search engine performs. It's eliminating anything that doesn't have anything to do with what you're looking for. And so what if users could do it themselves if Plone doesn't help you? And we have a perfect solution for that, namely fast navigation. But first we have to decide which facets do we want to use. And that's where, that's what our process entailed. So, so in, in this project, we needed to decide, make a bunch of decisions. So in terms of metadata, we said, okay, we want title, description, URL, uh, tags, and so on. And there is a really nice add-on, Collective Jekyll, which I like a lot, and I also gave it a star in our contest. And, let's see, ah. So, if, in case you haven't seen it, it gives you a little viewlet that appears in the byline of uh, the content if you're an editor. <coughs> you see that red little thing there? That's a viewlet that Collective Jekyll puts there, and it has a little drop-down arrow, so you can click on it. It says warning, and when you click on it, it uh, drops down this uh, summary of content quality symptoms. And in this case, the um, this, this page does not have a summary, and that's the one that's red, everything else is green. So, me as a content editor, I can just go in, uh, give it a summary, and in this case the summaries are hidden so you don't see it, but now it's green, it says OK. So, this is what Jekyll gives you, and it's, it's really nice. And I looked at the code, it's very, actually, I, I, I like that, it's, it's really well written, I think, and, and it's really easily extensible. So we decided, okay, let's, let's uh, start brainstorming what symptoms, what, symptoms, what symptoms do we want to use? And, and prioritize, which ones are we going to fix first? So we want, we want, uh, we want to have really good titles, so we want them all to be title page, no, no, um, no all caps titles, no all lowercase titles. We don't you know, follow the AP style guide and be really, really clean about it. But then what are we going to do about acronyms that are in all in order to look in uppercase? So that's, that's something that I handled in a particular Jekyll filter that I created. Then uh, the summary, aka description. So we want every content item to have a description. It has to be a, you know, a complete sentence. It, it doesn't have, it, it has to be not the same as the title or, or even contain the title as a substring. Uh, it has to be you know, well, properly spelled with a capital letter and so on. So that's another symptom that we, that, you know, there is some stuff already in Collective Jekyll, but we improved it. And then the page ID, you know, when you're creating a copy, the page ID always has a copy of in front of it. And so that is, first of all, it's ugly, but moreover, it's actually like a symptom of uh, work that was probably left undone, unfinished. And so it's good to fix that. So the other thing is Collective Jekyll, uh, does not do is it gives you that little viewlet with a uh, okay or warning and also gives you a collection that you can use but it all it computes all these symptoms on the fly when you actually you know requesting a page um, so I created a custom index so that all that those symptoms are persisted in the catalog and we can create reports and so Reports we can create with uh, Fastlane Navigation, and here you see a, uh, a widget in Fastlane Navigation that has the symptoms, and so then uh, the managers could give um, the task to their editors to go and 
okay, let's start fixing all the titles. And so people could, and there are other widgets down there that you don't see so that people could find all the, the things that they had to fix. And so that's how the process worked. Then tags, we decided to do a control vocabulary, none of this folksonomy stuff. So with Plone Keyword Manager, we eliminated uh, all the bad keywords, the duplicates and so on. And with the ASO, we um, removed the widget that lets editors add new keywords. Instead, they can only pick from a control vocabulary. And that's helpful. Um, let's see, did I skip some? Okay. Okay, then we have to decide what facets do we want in, uh, in our search page. You know, that's... And for those, uh, I need to create some custom indexes. The division is one. It's based on the path, but it's not the same thing as the path. The category is just default category index. The type, okay. Let's be honest. Users do not care about the, the, the content types that we create at all. So we like our dexterity and archetype schemas and all that stuff, but users do not care. So let's consolidate. So all of these, document folder, link, collection, form folder, are all bun bundled into a page, a Trinet web page type. But there are some types that they do care about. So whereas Word, Excel, PowerPoint, videos, and all of that, that, that other stuff is just fi a file to us, to the users, th those are really important things to to be able to filter out. We don't want to show images in the search results. Um, and we want to keep blog entries and events as separate types. So those stay. Um, the last modified is another fasted search widget. This is a last modified relative date widget. So, you know, we use this week, this month, this year, over a year ago, or all. And so this needs to be updated every day with a cron job, cron job. And finally, this is the result. And you don't see all the widgets on the left, but we talked about it. Oh, and obviously this is uh, Bootstrap, so it's responsive. And like Amazon does, uh, you don't see the widgets when you first load the page, but you can, you, they pop up when you click the button, and you can set them, apply them, and then the, the search results are updated. All right, talked about almost everything. Just want to give you a few takeaways. So for TriMet, this meant they, they needed to decide on which facets they wanted. This was a process. They needed to this, decide on a controlled vocabulary for tags, and they needed to decide which content quality symptoms they cared about and prioritize them and work on them um, on a schedule. For me, I had to create a bunch of indexes, I had to create the reports, uh, and I had to create the search page, and so on. Uh, oh. For Plum, okay, this is for us as a community. We need to get, get be better editor feedback on content quality, and that's that's something that Castle does, and I think we should we should uh, definitely do something like that. Uh, we need to be able to give users a way to uh, both filter, like now the, the folder contents view in Plum Five is great. Now you can. You can do bulk updates, but you still can't really do a lot with other metadata, like content quality of the summary, for example. You can't really do it. And bulk edits. So, think about content quality. It always matters. And that's it.